Our first speaker today is David Sackett. David's the Managing Director of Growth Farms that manages and they manage ag land um, throughout Australia for investors. So they buy land and they manage it for investors. They're a pretty major operation. They, their farming enterprises range from sugar to sheep to beef. They manage about $300 million worth of, of land. They run about 150,000 sheep, 20,000 cattle. David is on the Future Farm Industry CRC and numerous other industry boards. So he's a man with a lot and broad experience in relation to agriculture. So I welcome David. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, it's it's uh, a pleasure to be here and um, I'm sure you're going to find it a fairly stimulating day because I think there'll be quite a diverse range of views presented on a range of issues. And, uh, and I guess I don't purport to have all the answers, but um, hopefully at the end of the day there's some questions we can raise that we can think about and think about where we're going in agriculture because I think it's a very exciting time. It's a very exciting time because... Um, yeah, suddenly agriculture is now talked about along with resources. So when they talk about minerals, they talk about agriculture and there's this whole issue of where we're going with food demand and what's going to happen to prices and profitability on farms and a whole heap of things happening. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, for those who are prepared to grasp the opportunity, a really exciting time and the whole issue of... Uh, money coming into the country and there's a whole debate about that. Those of you who saw Q&A on, uh, on uh, Monday night, um, there's certainly a diversity of views about what should happen in Australian agriculture and should we be taking, taking money in from uh, overseas investors. So there's a whole heap of issues that we have to face and I, and I think uh, I'm going to touch on a few of those. But really I guess my core message is that we shouldn't get distracted. We shouldn't get distracted from our core business while a lot of these things are going on. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to cover a range of things. Some of, the, some of what I'm going to talk about is not uh, directly applicable, as in you know, some examples I'm going to draw from cotton farms and various other things because we work across a range of sectors. But I think it's also good to look across a range of sectors and think about what others do and, and some of the issues around those. <laughs> so one of the key themes that, uh, that is driving a lot of people's thinking at the moment is, um, I guess, summarised by this comment from one of the bosses of BlackRock, which is a, uh, one of the largest uh, institutional investors globally. And he's saying, invest in ag, Go to the beach for the next five years and everything will be right. And it sounds very seductive and it sounds fantastic. Um, I think it's an easy thing to say from... Um, I'm not sure who's going to actually run the farm while you're at the beach, but that's a separate issue. <laughs> but the implication is that uh, you know, we have really rosy times ahead of us, that, that it's going to be great. And we can see that because there's a lot of institutional money looking at investing in agriculture. Only a very small part of it's coming into Australia. A large parts of it going into Africa, large parts of it going into the Middle East. Uh, sorry, into uh, Eastern Europe, um, the, the Ukraine, and those sorts of places. Large parts going into into Latin America, and and it's becoming the flavour of the month. And and I think in the next three to five years we'll see a lot more come along. Um, they they're not uh, they're just. The, these people with large buckets of money are just like everybody else. They have a herd mentality and they'll follow along from what, it, what the others do. And so suddenly when they see significant other people investing in ag, they'll all want to jump in the same way. And I think that has implications for those of you who are likely to be uh, retiring or, or selling land, but also obviously implications for those of you who want to expand because... If that comes, well, I think it's when it comes to pass, not if it comes to pass, we'll see substantial pressure on land prices. Whether that's going to happen in a couple of years or five years or ten years, I don't know. Probably at the moment we've actually got pressure downward on land prices while this mess in Europe is, is working through. So that's one view of the world, and that's an increasingly common view of the world. Um, 
But I, I think, should, should we as producers take that view of the world? And I, I think it's, uh, as I said, seductive, but I think it's actually dangerous if we do, because there's a lot relying on uh, that happening and that coming to pass for the long-term trend in commodity prices to change. So I think as part of that, we've got this whole sort of uh, investment scene changing. On top of all that, we've got a range of other issues that I think are, are probably relatively immediate and urgent for farmers to focus on. We continue to lose farmers from agriculture. Um, on average, over the last 50 to 70 years, we've, lo we've lost about 1,200 per annum. Now, I think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. And it's a good thing because what it does is enable our industry to continue to um, expand for successful producers to, to reinvest. Um, if a business was still the same size as it was 50 years ago, we would all be unviable. And so we need continual change. We need, we need opportunities for successful farmers to expand. Um, we should see that as a positive, not a negative. It's not a threat. I mean, it, it may be a threat if the bank's hammering at your back door, and I understand that, but in, in the big scheme of things, we need to continue to rationalise the number of farmers we have. Um, there will be issues about age structure and qualifications and, and experience coming through, but if we, if we rail against that, we are railing against the long-term success of this sector, and we can't afford to do that. We're going to have increased demand for food, and uh, Julian Cribb will probably talk a lot about that tonight um, because it's one of Julian's um, key, th key issues these days. Um, we're facing a forecast of 70% increase in food demand by 2050. Is that going to mean food prices double? Does it mean we're going to have wars over food, all those sort of things? I don't know the answers to that. Um, I, th I think there's two views about this. There is a view that, that uh, you know, farmers are going to be the new BHPs and the new Rio Tintos. The other view is that farmers have this fantastic ability to respond to increased prices by increasing production. And we saw that in 2007 when wheat prices went through the roof. Next year, what happened to wheat area? It went through the roof. And look at what happened to cotton in the last 18 months. 18 months ago, cotton was worth $1,000 a bale. Cotton wall to wall, wherever cotton could be grown, price now $360 a bale. So, so farmers have this fantastic ability, when there's a good price signal, to generate a lot more product. And I think we tend to underestimate that. Um, and I guess this sort of thesis was first proposed by Malthus, when he said population increases exponentially and food supply increases linearly and we're going to run out. It was then came up again the Club of Rome in the 1960s, you know, we're going to run out of food. And in fact, we've got much more food than what we've ever had. I think the key uncertainty around it is the role of water in that food production system. So a large amount of the food that's produced globally is dependent on water. Uh, a lot of that water is being used unsustainably, particularly out of uh, bores. And, and so I think the question around water is probably a key one and one that may be different this time to other, other points about uh, food running out. At the same time, we've got increased demand on farmers. Um, there are social demands. There are environmental demands that weren't there 20 or 30 years ago. You're part of a bigger picture and what you, the decisions you make on your farm influence others in the, in the community. And, you, and those, you are expected to take in, in those things into account. Welfare is a major issue and, and uh, that will only continue to get more and more of an issue. And you know, the community demands a say in how their food is, is produced and how it's managed, even if the Indonesians eat it rather than us. Australians still want, to, uh, still want to say in our production systems. That will only get greater. It's not going to go away. The more affluent a society is, the, the more they can afford to choose and pick, and pick and demand about how we produce our food. As well as getting more complex, there's more information. 
that's the, the information that's available is more accessible. So there's a whole range of things there that are happening. The other fundamental thing is that farming is still a good business and it's a low risk business. Now, people might not sort of agree with me that it's a low risk business, but the reason it's a low risk business is that you're sitting on an asset that appreciates in value by six to eight percent per annum over the long term. There are very few businesses that sort of underpin your returns by six to eight percent per annum. What is the variable part, of course, is the operating yield. And, and that is variable, but agriculture is low risk. If you go and buy a corner store and, and pay half a million dollars or a million dollars for it or whatever the number is, someone could come along tomorrow and open a Woolies around the corner and blow your store out of the water. That can't happen in agriculture. The, the, your land sits there, it underpins your wealth, wealth accumulation over time. And so it is, it is low risk from that point of view. Sure, the operating returns are volatile, but in terms of the risk to your capital, it is low. I think even though the risk to, to your capital is low, I think there are some really interesting things to think about. And, and basically what we've got are businesses that uh, are quite volatile in their returns. And this is actually a cotton farm. I, I'm glad to say not one that, that we manage. Um, but the key thing about that is that a third of the years produced 90 odd percent of the profits. Irrigation tends to be more volatile. There was a couple of bad years there with, uh, with some pretty poor decision making. But over the long term, there are a small number of years where you make most of your money. If you look at the same thing for a livestock operation, it's a similar story. Not quite as extreme because it doesn't have the same volatility as cotton does. But the best third of the years generated half the profits in that business over about a 20, 18 or 20 year period. <clears throat> so you need to set your business up to think about how to manage those things. How do we, how do we capture that, those good years and how do we minimise the downside in the bad years? I think there are some really important points to think about when we come to, to think about managing this. The good years tend to be when both seasons and prices coincide. They both come together. The problem with it is that neither are predictable. Neither are predictable. And, and so, you know, there, there's a lot of huffing and puffing out there in agriculture about predicting the weather and basically if it's out past four days don't worry about it. So is that of any use to you when you're making a decision about, about am I going to plant canola or wheat or run more cattle? Those sort of time frames, the time frames that forecasts provide any accuracy are basically useless for the strategic decisions in agriculture. They, they're good for saying, will I cut that paddock for hay or will I spray that paddock or will I sow that dry? But they are useless for the big strategic decisions because they simply are not accurate out far enough. And sure, you'll hear people get it right occasionally, but they don't tell you about when they got it wrong. And, and, and so great tools for short-term stuff in terms of uh, seasons. I, I guess irrigation is one that's a little bit different in that you, you've got this dam up upstream, which actually provides some reservoir for you and, and so you can have some predictability of water availability, water availability in advance, but that's the exception. Prices are totally unpredictable as well and, and uh, again we've looked at this issue because we have people sitting in offices in London who say um, the forward market for wheat is looking disastrous, why are you planting wheat this year? And, uh, and we say, well, there are two good reasons. One, the forward market has no relationship at all to the price at harvest. So we don't see that it's, it adds any value to the decision. The second reason is that, that we, we take a philosophy that we're, the best thing to do is to have an agronomically, technically sound business and maximise the yield because we can't do much about the price side of it. And, and 
we look at ABEAR forecasts, and ABEAR is fantastic at some things, but it's not very good at forecasting. Is it ABEAR fault, ABEAR's fault? No. What they're trying to forecast is something that's impossible to forecast. And if you look at their track record, it is effectively random. It has no bearing on the price, the, the price forecast at the annual GABFest in Canberra in February every year has no relationship at all to the price achieved at harvest. It's random. Now, I think they should just stop doing it because there's, it, doesn't, it just distracts everybody. But the point is that, that if we're trying to capture this volatility that we've got in agriculture, we don't have tools which tell us in advance what, that, what the outcome is going to be. So our farm system needs to be resilient, but it also needs to be responsive. Because you can't predict the seasons, because you can't predict the price, you've got to set up the system that's going to give you the best chance of delivering over the long term and be able to tweak it on the way through so that in those good years you convert as much as you can into a saleable product. So if we think about resilient farm systems, what, what sort of issues are we thinking about? The downside and the upside. So we've got to limit the downside in bad years and we've got to have quick recovery after those bad years. So we see a lot of farm businesses now that still have not recovered at all in, in terms of their production, not even financially, but in terms of their production from some of those horror years through the early 2000s. There was some... There was, they were difficult years and they were really hard to make right decisions in those years. But some farms basically made decisions which are terminal. They will not recover from the decisions they made. And, and uh, in most of those cases, it was about the time taken to recover their business, to get back to full productivity. For many of them, they may be back there by the time the next drought comes along. And that's unfortunate. But that, you, know, you have to set your system up so it can recover quickly. Probably the best example of a system that can recover quickly is a mixed farms, you know, where you've got the ability to crop. They're in a really fortunate position because you, in the cropping side of the system, you take the hit in the year of the drought. And then in the livestock part of the system, you take the hit in the year following the drought. You're still feeding, you're still, the bill's still going, whereas the cropping was last year. And, and there's a really good opportunity in mixed farming systems to, to, to flip the balance fairly strongly between those two. So expand the cropping area and reduce the livestock substantially and, and gen, still generate some really good income. They're, they're in a very fortunate position. It's very much harder when you're totally livestock dominant and, and it's a much harder trade-off. One of the other key things is to be a low-cost producer. And, and that's nothing new. I guess we've been talking about that for some time. A low-cost producer is not, a, not necessarily a low-cost farm. It's a low cost per unit of product that you produce. They are very different things, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. There's the inevitable question, should a resili does a resilient farm tend to be low input or does it, be, does it tend to be higher input? And... In the last 10 years, we've had this sort of loony craze go through the industry about uh, we don't need to put fertiliser out and what we need to do is encourage plant growth and, and capture all that unused fertiliser that's sitting in the soil and it recycles itself. It, it's just wrong and it's just costing the industry a lot of money. There is no evidence to support it. I don't know why it gets any traction out there. And, and those farms, are, and we're just about to buy one. It's fantastic buying because he stuffed it up so badly because of this belief that he doesn't need to do those fundamental things anymore. And, and with, with strategic use of fertiliser and the right inputs, the productivity of that farm will be changed by 50% in a couple of years. So it's not about low input or high input necessarily. It's about what is the best thing that drives the system over the long term. And when we think low or high input, 
we, we tend to immediately think about fertiliser and pastures and high input pasture systems, all those sort of things. I think it's, it's much more than that. There are parts of the farm business where you deliberately want very low input, as low as you can possibly get it. An example of that is machinery. Another example is labour. So you want to minimise the inputs on those things, minimise the overheads in the business. So you want a low input system for some characteristics of the business. In other parts of the business, you want relatively high inputs. So you want your farms relatively well fertilised so that they are responsive and when you hit those bad years where rainfall's a constraint, you grow two to three more times dry matter per millimetre on well fertilised pastures. So it's not about is a low, in, low input system right or wrong. Your different components of the business need low versus high inputs. There's always the question of should we specialise or should we diversify? And, and uh, I don't think it matters, to be quite honest. I think it matters to pick the thing where you have a competitive advantage and do it well. That might be beef production. And if you're an outstanding producer of beef, then it will be a very successful business compared to someone who's an average producer of sheep. It's about picking something, one or two things, and doing it well. The only thing I would say is it's not about picking eight things because you will not do any of them well. But pick the things where you have a competitive advantage by the nature of your farm, by your skills, by your passion, by your geographic region, whatever it is, and do that well. You can do two things well, probably can't do three or four or five well. I struggle to do one well sometimes. So don't, don't try and have too many things happening. The worst example I've seen is 23 different enterprises on a farm. It's just impossible, just a disaster. The key thing, I think, is in resilience is that you've got to be a low-cost producer. And so if we look at, for example, at lamb... That's the price of lamb for the last uh, 10 years. On that line, the horizontal line on there, is the average cost per kilogram of carcass weight for producers to produce that lamb. So there's about six years or eight years in there or something like that where the, the cost to produce it exceeds the value of the product. You're consigned to making a loss that year, but in each of those years. Alternatively, if you look at the most efficient land producers, that's where their cost of production sits in relation to the price of lamb over the last 10 years. So basically, there's a couple of years where they broke even. It was the worst result they got. It's the single most important thing you must get right as a producer of commodities is the cost per kilo per tonne that you produce it for. It's the thing that drives mining companies. So the reason BHP now has been so phenomenally successful was the previous managing director, whose name eludes me, but it basically he went through the whole portfolio and sold out mines that were high-cost mines. He said, I'm going to focus this on the mines that are low-cost and cleaned out the whole portfolio and left them with a very good quality um, portfolio of mines, that being low-cost. And so you're always going to be competitive in the marketplace because you're at the low end of the, of the cost curve. Likewise for wheat. There's the price of wheat for the last 10 years and there's the average cost to produce a tonne of wheat. If you're an average producer, it's been a bit painful. There have been plenty of years where you didn't make any money. Um, if, if, on the other hand, you're, you're amongst the top wheat producers, there's only a couple of years where you didn't make money. You've only got two things that you can seriously control in the business. The price, sorry, you've only got two things that really drive it, the price and the cost, of, the cost to produce it. You can't control the price. We talked about that before. The price is unpredictable, it's uncontrollable. As commodity producers, you, you, it's very hard to differentiate your product. A 22 kilo carcass lamb with three mils of fat is the same as the next one. You can't differentiate your product to, conduct, to get a premium out of there. So you have to be a low-cost producer because that's the only thing that's left for you to manipulate. You can't manipulate price up. You've got to manipulate the cost to grow it down. So if we think about 
these responsive farm systems. I, I think responsiveness to, to good and bad years is more about management. It's got to be technically sound farm business. It's got to be well fertilised. I'm not going to talk about all these things because I think it's reasonably well known what a technically sound farm business looks like if you're a cropper, if you're a mixed farmer, if you're a beef producer or a sheep producer, whatever, you, whatever it might be. There's plenty of information and plenty of expertise out there to, to guide you on how to set up a, a, a productive, technically sound farm business. It's not particularly difficult. But the key thing is, in responsiveness to those good years, is for your farm to be able to add production cheaply and quickly. So add kilograms to the animals you're, you're selling. In a, in a spring like last year, taking animals and putting another 20, 30, 40 kilos on them. Same again this year, hopefully. Add nitrogen to crops when you're, more, when you're confident about the ability of the crop to get through. Add area if you can, if you're an irrigation farmer and more water is available, add area. So there's a range of things that you can do to respond. Um, but they have to be tactical. It's very hard to be street strategic about those things. I think the other, the other key thing in, in, um, in successful farm businesses is that they know what does not matter. So as I said earlier, we have this vast amount of information sloshing around and it gets vaster all the time and it makes it harder and harder to make decisions. I, I think we need a list of things that says what we don't worry about. And it just makes life much easier. It doesn't clutter up your mind with all the, all the waffle that's going on. The things that I've given you a list of a few of the things that I think don't matter. Chasing price premiums. So going to be a, becoming an organic producer or producing out of season. I, th I think the only time you should be an organic producer is if you're in the channel country in Queensland and you always have been an organic producer. And you should maybe consider it then. But it just the penalties in production don't justify the increased price you receive. So I just don't see any point going there. Likewise, without a season production, trying to produce steers or lambs or whatever it is when the price peaks. Price peaks for a good reason. There aren't many around. They're hard to make fat at that time of the year. So chasing price premiums in mainstream agricultural business is a serious distraction. Price risk management. Again, uh, not such an issue with uh, beef producers or lamb producers, but it is some reason in wheat, in cotton, it's a, it's a plague on the industry. They spend so much time trying to work out whether or not the, the dollar's moved half a cent and what that means. Wheat producers do the same thing. What's happened in Chicago this morning? All the market reports about all those sort of things. Just looked at a study of 1,000 farmers in the US and those farmers, uh, they, they were all involved with various price risk management strategies for their cropping. And, um, and they looked at the, benef the result from their price risk management activities and they compared that to selling one twelfth of their crop every month through the year. Which came out in front? Sell one twelfth of the crop every month, every year. And don't worry about all these other fancy things. There, there is an exception to that, and that exception is if the bank is, is uh, snapping at your heels and you need to sell steers for $2.20 or something like that this year to meet interest payments, then I think there is the potential to uh, mount, an argue, mount an argument to have price risk managed activities. Otherwise, don't bother. Just forget about it. Just, just get on and produce the stuff and don't worry about all those distractions. The grazing system debate, I think, is a total distraction. It only matters around the margin and it matters if maybe a little bit in managing bare land in some years, but, but should you move them quickly around heaps of paddocks or should you move them slowly around a few of paddocks or should you leave them there all year? Does not matter. The only other exception to that would be loosen or some other pasture that actually needs rotationally to be grazing to survive. Farming carbon is a serious distraction. <clears throat> now, I know that might not be a popular view of the world, 
But all the sort of preliminary work done to date is that we have to get a carbon price of somewhere around about 200 bucks a tonne before we start to manage our production to maximise carbon. If you can increase carbon in your existing system and grazing systems, you can do that quite simply without foregoing production, then by all means. But don't farm carbon, don't forego production for carbon. Carbon in Europe at the moment is worth 10 bucks a tonne. So we've got a long way to go. Now, that might appear like a sort of a Luddite view of the world. Um, I mean, we, there is so much uncertainty around it, about it, it politically, economically and, and technically, that if you're starting to set your farm business up to farm carbon, then I think you, you're going to hope for a very long life or a, ver, a, a chance of things coming off the way you want it. But I just think it is... It is something that we just don't go there. Now, probably, I haven't looked at the program, probably you'll get some speakers stand up straight after lunch and say, Sackett was full of crap, and fair enough, it wouldn't be the first time. But, it, it, you know, it's, it's all too early to be doing that. It, five years, ten years, twenty years down the track, we may have a very different view. But don't get distracted from your core business. And most technology doesn't, most new technology also doesn't matter. Most of it's irrelevant to the business. But always, obviously, look for new technology and new opportunities, but most of it will only distract you. What really does matter in your farm business? Three things. Those three things. Productivity, productivity and productivity. Productivity is very different to production. It's not about maximising the amount you produce. Productivity is the amount you produce in relation to what you put in. What you're putting in is fertiliser, machinery, labour, whole heap of things going in. It's, it's about the amount coming out in relation to what goes in. So what we want are highly productive systems, i.e. we want as much coming out as what we can for, for the inputs that we're putting in the bottom. And that gives you a low-cost system, a low cost per kilo or per tonne. And if we, if we look at uh, where we're at, um, where various sectors are at, have been at, and so looking, looking backward, which is what ABA is very good at doing and have generated this data, productivity gains of the sheep sector, 0.3% per annum, Beef, one and a half. Most of the beef has come out of northern Australia through fencing, BTEC programs. Cropping, over 2% per annum. The sheep industry has a woeful track record in productivity gains, and that's why we see cropping moving further east. It's why we have seen the sheep sector really struggle, particularly the wool sector, for the last 20 years. Obviously, the lamb sector has done incredibly well on the price side of things. But unless we address that, those of you who are sheep producers, particularly if you're wool producers, unless that is addressed across the industry, I think in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, something like that, here I am trying to predict the future, and I've just given people a bagging for trying to predict the future, but anyway, I predict <laughs> that, that wool sheep will only be run where you can't possibly do anything else simply because if this industry continues to have such poor productivity gains, it, other sectors will just out-compete it. You'll run beef, you'll crop, you'll do anything instead of running sheep. Now, sheep meat is different because we've got a very different story there, but the wool side of the industry, I think, basically is a tale of woe uh, because it has failed to grasp this productivity issue and continues to fail to grasp it. So. So our fearless leader a couple of weeks ago in the land said we need to spend more money on marketing in China and that will fix the industry's problem. Total disaster. Total disaster if the industry is going to continue down that path. And it sort of makes me very sad because I think we're seeing an industry in demise for that reason. So the sheep meat side of it will pick up and keep going but it continues to need to focus on productivity gains. Cropping does it well, pretty, pretty well all the time. And part of the reason cropping does it well is that uh, you've got all these large commercial organisations called John Deere and, um, and uh, what's, the, what's the one that makes the yellow ones? I don't know. Um, New Holland or something like that. You've got green ones and blue ones and yellow ones. They, they continue to invest for, for new technology 
on your behalf, which is fantastic. So it's not all relying on R&D. But every year when the, when the header comes, they've added, they seem to add another 300 mils out to the side. Every year when the shearer comes, his back's worse and the comb is no wider than it was last year. And unless we can address some of those issues, we've got a real problem in, in, in the wool side of it. And that's why we see Dorpers coming in. You know, Dorpers are now 12% um, of the flock in WA, I think. So where are these gains going to come from that we're going to rely so heavily on? They're going to come from productivity of labour, and I think this is a really important issue because in the next 10 years or so, labour shortages are going to get even harder than what they are now. Um, you know, Gina Reinhardt needs 1,700 people to help her dig a hole in the ground. Um, Agriculture is going to be affected, and certainly in WA, if you go to WA now, um, the people that are... It, it is much harder in agriculture in WA to attract and retain staff than it is over here. Um, but that will only continue. So I think we need to be asking the question of our farm businesses. What do we need to do to set up our farm so in 10 years' time we can run it with half the amount of labour? I think you've got to take that question away and think about it. In 10 years' time, if I have half the amount of labour, how will I be able to run my farm? And you need to start setting it up now, start investing in that. Be it technology, fancy new technology, or be it simple stuff like fences and laneways and various things like that. Livestock productivity, I think, is, uh, continues to be an issue and... Um, we need to focus on continued genetic gain all the time. And certainly there are, there are really exciting opportunities um, in the sheep industry through the, through the um, activities of the sheep CRC with providing increased rates of genetic gain, uh, genomic technologies, those sorts of things. They're not going to sort of overturn things in the next couple of years, but in the long term I think they're very exciting and they will make genetic gain much more interesting and much more achievable. Likewise, we need to be, continue to achieve productivity gains on our land. And, and how will we do that? I, I think there is some, some very exciting stuff happening to uh, improve the productivity of our land. Um, and uh, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm involved with Future Farm Industries, CRC, and I just wanted to show you a few examples of things that are coming down the pipeline, which uh, may not come out the end, but you know, some of them are pretty exciting in terms of what they have to offer. Um, and that they'll offer for, peop for farms in this region in the sort of systems if you've got here. Um, there's a lotus, a legume, which is, uh, you know, getting... is just in the pre-commercialisation phase, and, and the advantage of this lotus as a legume is, is its acid tolerance... Um, it's, um, it, it, as it's coming out, it's looking quite promising. The agronomic trials and management systems are, are being looked at um, and how we, how we best manage that in our systems are being looked at at the moment. We've got uh, drought-tolerant phalaris, coxfoot and fescues. The biggest issue we've got with perenniality in our systems, I think, is persistence. And so if we can bring in... Uh, more persistent perennial species, um, then I think that is a big boost for perenniality and productivity of our systems. And so these cultivars have been selected out to better withstand drought. And everybody knows how many of these perennials we lost out of the system through the first decade. Um, if we can keep them alive and not have to bear the cost of going back in and re-establishing, it will make a huge difference to the productivity of our land systems. Um, the one up the top, the next one, is a thing called Tedera, or Tedera, depending on whether you speak Spanish or English. But um, Tedera is from the um, Canary Islands. Um, it is the most inhospitable environment you can imagine. I think there's something like 200 mils of rainfall a year and hot westerly winds coming out of the Sahara for a fair chunk of the year. And this plant has come from there. It's been... been uh, seed has been collected and it's been... Um, bred up in uh, Western Australia. It's now, we've now got sites um, 
in Eastern Australia as well. The plant is a legume and it actually makes lucerne look like a bit of a wuss. Um, it uh, it's, seems to be much more tolerant of acid soils, much more tolerant of uh, waterlogging, and uh, unlike lucerne, that the first sort of hot northwesterly hits it and it drops its leaves, Tadera actually retains its leaves and, the, and they continue to sit there and so you can graze, you don't lose it all over, the, over a hot summer period. Um, I mean, today I, I hate the term silver bullets because we always think a silver bullet might come along somewhere and help us turn our business around, but Tadera is probably the first thing that I've seen that actually has the hope of being a silver bullet. Uh, and um, it may yet fall over um, for some reason, but the, the picture there are grazing trials on Tadera in Western Australia, and, and um, even if it live, fulfills half its promise as a new pasture, it, it is potentially fantastic. Um, Evergraze, I think, is part of it, and that's part of putting... We're much more conscious now of putting the right plants in the right part of the landscape and getting the right combinations for productivity. <clears throat> Are we looking at fundamental change of our systems? Will our farms look like this in 10 years' time? Will we, have, will we be growing ethanol on our farms? Ho-hum, maybe, maybe not. I, I think it's probably unlikely that we'll see wholesale change. Um, but it may be that there will be incremental change and we'll see, we'll see uh, changes to our farm systems. I know they won't quite look like that up and down the hills um, in this area, like, like they do in WA. But, but there's certainly, you know, as the energy thing changes, there will be a whole heap of possibilities. I think what's more likely is that the straw will be converted to energy rather than growing trees for it specifically. So the challenges, I think, for farmers in the next uh, decade or so are to develop that resilient and responsive system. It's about being a low-cost producer. It's about being efficient. The next thing is think about where your productivity is going to come from over the next five or ten years. You must, individually and collectively, we must continue to achieve productivity gains. And when we look around, there's plenty of scope to do it. It's, there's uh, human capital, plenty of ideas. Obviously, we're constrained with R&D. But as we have fewer farms, that, that in itself will give us greater productivity gains. And then some exciting new technology coming along as well. So I think there's a lot to look forward to. Thank you.